Um, welcome everybody to the Superbuller Grand Rounds. Uh, every year we celebrate uh, Dr. Superbuller with a special Grand Rounds in his name. Uh, last year we were very saddened by his passing and we were able to join together in a special memorial last October. Uh, Dr. Superbuller was really a pioneer in pediatric cardiology and uh, we really owe him um, this, this uh, program that we, we have. He, um, to summarize um, his history, you know, he was a local, he was an undergraduate uh, from Allegheny College, then uh, did his medical degree um, um, in, uh, in Penn, and then training at Penn and the University of Michigan, then was in the military, and then training internal medicine and adult cardiology. But he had a true passion for pediatric cardiology, which at the time was just uh, starting as a subspecialty. He um, uh, ended up um, coming back, uh, coming to Pittsburgh in 1963, and then was um, really built the program and was uh, chief of cardiology since uh, you know 63, 67 to uh, like uh, the 90s, and had also a great. Um, you know, service to cardiology, to children's hospital. He was acting chair, he was medical director. He really had devotion to our hospital and built um, really an, a, a very, very strong pediatric cardiology uh, program. He also had significant academic contributions with very land landmark papers and um, was a master clinician, loved by his patients, was very, very humble, uh, and there were some quotes in, in an interview that he had uh, with a false cassette uh, that really he never put himself uh, uh, up on a level about families or patients or staff members, that he was free of pretensions and an incredible sense of humor and dedication uh, to his students, colleagues, patients, and families. Uh, so Dr. Superbuller also enjoyed life. Um, he loved the mountains and climbed many and also contributed to some papers on the uh, congenital heart disease at altitude. Uh, and, um, and truly, I think we stand today you know, on the shoulders of giants and our, our success of our program uh, is very much uh, thanks to his legacy, the program he built. Uh, locally, he's known as a legendary local. Um, he had um, four children that he um, brought up with his wife, Jan, uh, in a 70 acre farm housing many horses, and, uh, and he also ended up um, having an incredible, um, you know, beautiful um, contribution to the wildflowers in Western Pennsylvania. There's a website that you can find, and he described 900 species. Now, every, every year, except for last year because of the pandemic, we gathered um, in honor of Dr. Sobir Bueller, and we've had um, invited speakers uh, pioneers for, uh, from um, really scientists and um, clinicians from uh, all over the world that have presented since uh, 2008, the Superbuller Ground Rounds. And today we have um, the special pleasure to have Dr. Charlie Berul, who is Chief of the Division of Cardiology at Children's Hospital, uh, at Children's National Medical Center in DC, and co-director of the Children's National Heart Institute, He's tenure professor of pediatrics, professor of biomedical engineering at, at George Washington University. And um, he um, um, got his undergraduate degree from Bucknell University and received the MD from University of Maryland and completed residency at Yale, then fellowship in pediatric cardiology and electrophysiology at CHOP. And he was director of the pacemaker and defibrillator program at Boston Children's uh, where our past crossed then. Um, and became division chief at Children's National in 2009. And he has had lots of academic contributions in the uh, field of pediatric electrophysiology, more than 200 publication, and uh, also invited speaker, over 300 presentations, and also significant con scientific contributions. He's mentored dozens of trainees um, and also known for very collaborative style. Um, his scientific work with that, uh, began with cellular electrophysiology and clinical genetics uh, of inherited arrhythmias. Um, he had been mentored by uh, big people like Dr. Seidman, and then over the past two decades has uh, focused more on developing um, novel minimally invasive approaches uh, to the heart, um, 
and improving methods for pediatric pacing and defibrillation. And today he's going to talk to us, uh, share with us um, his thoughts on pediatric focus innovations in cardiac electrophysiology. Charlie, welcome to Pittsburgh. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Let's get my screen going. Okay, good. You see the screen? Yes. Okay, well, thank you again, and thanks for the invitation. I was really looking to uh, coming back to Pittsburgh in person. Uh, the pandemic has changed a lot of things, but we've all gotten pretty good at Zoom and virtual meetings. So thank you again for uh, allowing me to join and uh, participate in Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. There's some disclosures before we start. Uh, you talked a little bit about Dr. Zubrubriller. I did have the honor uh, and pleasure of meeting him uh, when I was uh, looking at fellowships and, and jobs, and he recruited me uh, several decades ago. Uh, he was really an innovator and researcher who saved the lives of thousands of children, taught countless students, and lived the life free of pretensions. I got this similar uh, post-Gazette quote that you saw, which was really, uh, really said a lot about him. Uh, Dr. Fisher said, I called him a Renaissance man. Lee Bierman called him a pioneer but to many, he was simply Dr. Zub. This was my favorite quote of his because it really says a lot about the person and, and it uh, is something I, I feel as well. So he said, I like dealing with children and I like the subject matter. And for those of you who are here on Grand Rounds, many of you are uh, pediatricians or pediatric trainees uh, deciding on what to do. And this is how I felt about deciding to go into pediatric cardiology. I liked dealing with kids and I liked the subject matter because heart disease in children is usually congenital defects and there are hundreds of different anomalies and hundreds of combinations. It's like putting together pieces of the puzzle and that proved to be very interesting and challenging. That quote really resonated with me. Now, my affinity, affinity for Pittsburgh really started early. That's me my, when I lived in Pittsburgh in 1971. My dad worked for American Can Company. Uh, that's my elementary school in Mount Lebanon. And that's what Pittsburgh looked like in 1971, the streetcars, lots of snow. And so when uh, Zub tried to recruit me back uh, 25 years later, well, let me get this. This is another uh, slide of 1971. It was really a good year for Pittsburgh uh, from, a, from a sports and, and sports fan standpoint. So I really loved it during those days. Um, and when he tried to recruit me back in 1993, the pic pictures of Pittsburgh were a lot sunnier. Uh, this is a great picture of a colorful Pittsburgh. And I was recruited to uh, work with Dr. Bierman and Dr. Zuber Bueller, and really a great team there. And that's uh, my young family at the time that they recruited us to come visit. But it wasn't to be. I ended up going to Boston and uh, working with Dr. Kreutzer was one of the great parts about uh, my decision to go to Boston. Uh, but I still have a close affinity uh, for Pittsburgh. And so what we're gonna talk about today are several different pediatric focused innovations related to cardiac electrophysiology. And I know it's a broad audience, some cardiac uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, but many are uh, pediatricians, other providers and trainees. So I'm gonna have a wide range of uh, expectations of background. We're gonna talk about three broad topics catheter ablation, pacemakers, and defibrillator innovations that relate specifically to pediatrics. And the common goal of all of these three innovations we're gonna to review today are to eliminate the use of radiation in children because we all know about the harmful effects of ionizing radiation that children may be particularly susceptible to. And so avoiding that in medical procedures is a, an important goal. We know that children aren't just small adults, so we need to make things that are customized for children, not just smaller, but unique to their specific needs. And so let's talk about radiation reduction during catheter ablation in pediatrics. So in the 20th century, this is how we used to do catheter ablation, 20th century being only 20 years ago, uh, we would put catheters in under fluoroscopic guidance and put them in the right atrium, the His bundle, the right ventricle and the coronary sinus behind the left atrium. And we would position them using x-ray. And when we did the ablation, we had the x-ray on to make sure we didn't uh, cause any damage with, with the catheter moving. And now in the 21st century, we uh, predominantly use something called electroanatomic mapping, 
which is kind of like Waze in your car. It's a combination of GPS and virtual reality to see the catheters as they move through the heart. And here's some of the uh, early work that I was involved with, again, about 10 years ago. So this is new technology. And this is a study looking at a randomized study comparing X-ray to electroanatomic mapping. And now when we think about it in 2021, as a parent, I would not put my kid in a randomized study of radiation versus no radiation because uh, it's not no longer a clinical equipoise. But back then we weren't really sure. And so here they show the control group, which is X-ray, and the study group, with, which is X-ray plus electroanatomic mapping, and showed the uh, fluoroscopy time was obviously much higher if you didn't use fluoroscopic, uh, non-fluoroscopic techniques. Uh, and most of that time was during the ablation part of the procedure. And here's the breakdown on this chart. Here's radiation exposure in milligrays. It was pretty high in the control group with a wide range, and even in the study group with a wide range between uh, you know, up to uh, 3,000 milligray. Uh, in, uh, like you can see the, the broad range in this group, but it was reduced in the study group. The total fluoroscopy time was reduced, the radiation exposure was reduced without a significant increase in the uh, electrophysiology procedure time. And when it got to Children's National, we did a similar study, but five years later, non-randomized, just looking at our trend of uh, average fluoroscopy time in minutes. And you can see that across the country, uh, we, this, this new technology was adopted and the fluoroscopy time progressively decreased to now uh, nearly zero. And uh, again, by different substrates, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, maybe nodal reentry, atrial tachycardias and ventricular tachycardias, there's a significant reduction uh, before and after the introduction of uh, electroanatomic mapping. And currently 78 or 80% of our cases have zero fluoroscopy and the vast majority of the others are under two minutes compared to a mean of 18 and a range of you know, 10 to 60 minutes uh, in the 1990s. It's a dramatic uh, improvement in technology for children. And here's an article from Pittsburgh. So Barov and others and uh, Cheyenne Beach, when she was a fellow at Pittsburgh, uh, published this paper looking at 3D mapping and showed the importance of decreasing radiation exposure, even if you didn't have a goal of zero fluoroscopy, uh, any reduction is important. And for those of you who aren't cardiac electrophysiologists and may not have had the opportunity to see what this looks like, here's a movie of what we do. There's the catheter moving through the right atrium, again, with no fluoroscopic guidance. We're using this. And you can see how it looks like Waze. It looks like your car is driving on the road. And here, the catheter is uh, we, we call painting or moving around the right atrium to see what the walls of the right atrium are. Uh, we just erased a period when we went into the right ventricle. So you can just erase that off the screen and building a three-dimensional structure. Here, we go down all the way to the IVC. Uh, we come up, those little yellow dots are where the His bundle electrogram are. So we see a little His recording there. And so we mark it with the, the yellow dots so we know where, uh, where the normal electrical system is and where not to ablate. Uh, and then we'll try to get out into the coronary sinus, which is a structure between the left atrium and the left ventricle there, uh, which gives you good electrograms of the left side of the heart without having to go uh, transeptal or to the left side. And then you can put additional catheters in. Uh, so after you've drawn out the right atrium, you can put another catheter in to put it into the coronary sinus. This catheter goes up and around to map out the left side of the heart. Then one comes in and around and can go into the ventricle to give you ventricular electrograms and see where the right ventricle is. And then uh, finally one just to put at and around the, uh, the His bundle that will give you his bundle electrograms. And this color-coded EKG screen here uh, correlates with the colors of the catheter here. So you can see what each catheter is producing on the electrograms. So uh, it's, it's a, a nice three-dimensional color-coded structure. And so the last remaining part, now that we've conquered being able to put those catheters in without x-ray, is getting to the left side of the heart when needed for left-sided ablations. And uh, what I still often do is step on the pedal a little bit 
to, uh, to do fluoroscopy to cross the atrial septum. And uh, so that's the, sort of the last remaining bridge of what uh, we use fluoroscopy for. And so then we looked at Brad Clark, who was a fellow with us and now is at Montefiore, uh, looked at getting over to the left side of the heart safely without the use of fluoroscopy. And again, using these images of, from the electroanatomic mapping, you can see where the fossa ovalis is over here and mark that on the screen so that you know. And then use, tran, uh, uh, use either intracardiac echo or transesophageal echo. This is intracardiac echo or ICE. I guess ICE has different connotations these days with, with all the issues with immigration, but ICE is um, intracardiac echocardiography. And you can see the little um, uh, needle going across the atrial septum here and about to pop across. So you can see it safely without the use of x-ray. And then you make the track with the electroanatomic map, and then you can draw out the left atrium, as you can see here, uh, the left atrial structure, which sits right above the coronary sinus. And there's the track of the needle and catheter going across. So if you slip back to the right atrium, you can get right back in. And so in this uh, analysis, after we started doing this, we compared using uh, intracardiac echo and electroanatomic mapping, so no fluoro, with a combination of fluoro plus echo to just using fluoro. And if similar age and weight, um, the, the time was about the same. It didn't take us any longer to do it without fluoroscopy. The times were all about the same. And the fluoroscopy time was the only thing that was different. Not surprisingly, if you don't use fluoro, your fluoro time is zero, big surprise. If you use a combination of fluoro and echo, you can reduce the fluoroscopy time. Um, and, but even still, this last remaining fluoro of you know, three uh, to nine minutes is not so bad. Now, I know you have an interest in uh, MRI in cardiology uh, and you have a great team there. Uh, so one of the things that we've done as a next step is seeing what we could uh, use MRI for in electrophysiology, either for mapping of the scar to see where is the scar in the heart to predict where the abnormal rhythms might be and potential ablation targets and diffuse the MRI 3D image as shown here with the electroanatomic image. So you take this beautiful 3D MRI picture. And this is a patient with transposition of the great arteries who's undergone a sending procedure, an atrial switch procedure and color code each of the chambers. Uh, and then you can overlay uh, the picture from the electroanatomic map so that you get much more uh, anatomic detail and understanding, and particularly with patients who don't have a structurally normal heart. And I'm going to show you a study of lesion assessment using MRI to see the location of the lesion, the adequacy of the lesion, like the depth, and if there's any gaps in performing the ablation. And then the ultimate goal of maybe performing catheter ablation in the MRI uh, scanner rather than in the cath lab. So this is what is done with uh, electroanatomic mapping, not with MRI. So you see some ventricular arrhythmia and we do ablation and we make these little dots where we're putting the ablation. Some of it's automated. You can use uh, uh, something that, that automates the dots depending on how much time and temperature is at the spot, but it's still uh, an indirect measure of the lesion, and it's an artistic rendition of the lesion you're actually making. So can cardiac magnetic resonance do better? Here's some animal studies that show on this view, this is uh, the, the, the right atrium. This is the posterior right atrium and in, in pigs, they've put um, ablation lesions in, and you can see a gap in the ablation line, which would uh, predict an unsuccessful ablation. And they did MRI to show where the gap was and then uh, placed the lesions to solidify the line and make a continuous line, which would be more likely to be successful. It's even been done a little bit in humans. There's some adult uh, human data of MRI image guided ablation using passive catheter tracking where you can see the catheters uh, in the heart and being able to um, make the, uh, uh, the images visible with MRI showing the, the scar from the ablation. When you compare 
the marks that we make by electroanatomic mapping, these little red dots that we put in with the true uh, scar measured by uh, late gadolinium enhancement MRI, we can see that the, the marks that we make, these uh, mapping marks significantly overestimate the true scar. So if you took, this is a adult patient with atrial fibrillation and they do a huge ablation lines for atrial fibrillation to encircle the pulmonary veins at the uh, out, right outside the pulmonary veins, you make these big circles around them. And then these marks are purportedly where the ablation is occurring. But when you look at with the uh, MRI, we're more than twice, maybe three times marking what is the true uh, ablation. And so we sought to uh, look at whether MRI could identify the lesions we're making in pediatric ventricular tachycardia. And so this was a study done by Elena Grant when she was a fellow with us, with our uh, MRI uh, colleagues, both at Children's National and at the NIH. And we enrolled patient, patients who had VT. Uh, they got an MRI beforehand, then they got a standard EP study. And right after the EP study, they'd get a post-ablation MRI for no more than 30 minutes, and then standard clinical follow-up. Uh, and it helps to have an interventional cardiac MRI suite. This is uh, a lot more feasible when your MRI scanner and your fluoroscopy table are in the same room. And here's a, a track that they can just slide from one to the other, but it could be done uh, in two separate rooms. You don't have to have this suite, but it does make it nice to have. And at the time that we started doing this, we were really one of only two or three centers around the country to have this. And I understand Pittsburgh's gonna soon have this as well, which is exciting. So here's our initial uh, study, uh, with first 11 patients or so, uh, all children ranging from 1.8 years to 17 years with a variety of either congenital heart disease or structurally normal hearts, but all with a VT. And in the first group, uh, all of them had what we call acutely successful ablation, meaning the VT went away during ablation and uh, was still gone by the time you pulled the catheters out. And then the uh, immediately post MRI, whether there was late gadolinium enhancement visible, all but one, you could see the scar. And interestingly, that was the only patient that recurred. So it's too small. N of one is too small. This other patient had some isolated PVCs that recurred, but no more VT. Uh, so maybe that was an early identifier of an insufficient lesion, which was pretty exciting. This is what it looks like here. Before the ablation, this is what the MRI looks like. We put the ablation in this right ventricular outflow tract. Here, this is the right ventricle. This is the pulmonary artery. So this is the right ventricular outflow tract under the pulmonary artery. This is where we thought we made the lesion. And this is where the MRI shows the lesion and shows success. Uh, similarly, this is a patient who had ablation in the aortic cusp, uh, which is kind of a scary place to do ablation, but is a common spot for uh, VT to occur actually outside the heart and in the cusp of the aorta. Here's where we did the ablation in the aortic cusp. Here's the uh, lesion motion corrected uh, late gadolinium enhancement, where, right where the ablation was and uh, shows success. And this one is one where there's no success. No, uh, th this one had a recurrence. The post-ablation MRI, we didn't see any lesion there. And so uh, and if we do larger studies, if that's correlation, then maybe that gives you the potential to go back to the cath lab and, and ablate some more before waking the patient up from the procedure. So we, we um, showed that magnetic resonance can visualize the acute ablation lesions, uh, and they correlate with the clinical outcome in this small study. So potentially a decreased recurrent risk, and as I said, targeted ablation of gaps in the lesion. The next steps we're doing are to assess atrial substrates with MRI, because the atrium's less thick than the, uh, than the ventricle, and eventually, hopefully, real-time MRI-guided ablation when the tools and technology are ready. So I'm gonna switch here from uh, ablation to cardiac devices and talk a little bit about um, advances in pacemakers and defibrillator technology. I'm about halfway through, so my timing's good. So this is what pacing is thought about for pediatrics. And this screen, I showed this yesterday during the uh, great research symposium 
that was put on that I had the opportunity to be a part of. Here is um, a transvenous pacemaker in an infant. And here you see the transvenous lead going through the vein into the right atrium, a loop of coil to hopefully uncurl as the patient grows if there's no fibrosis or other issues. So it's a little bit optimistic, but that's the goal with transvenous pacing in young patients. And the more standard approach is an open chest approach, putting uh, pacing leads, the surgeon sews them onto the outside of the heart and tunnels them down to the pacemaker, usually in the belly. But most devices are not designed for the smallest of children. And so we may need to modify these, these devices that are designed for uh, adults. Now, transvenous leads aren't always possible, particularly in the smallest patients who have small veins, uh, in patients with venous anomalies or venous obstruction. And, um, and in the presence of congenital heart disease, some of these patients have either intracardiac shunts like an ASD or VSD. They don't have direct venous access to the heart because of uh, venous uh, malpositions. Or they may have a mechanical tricuspid valve that you don't wanna cross with the pacing lead and other prosthetic material scars, baffles and patches that preclude uh, transvenous pacing. And sometimes you just can't get there from here. Here's two examples. This is uh, a young woman with dextrocardia and transposition who, if, for those who can see uh, what angiography looks like, there's narrowing of this baffle. First of all, the heart's on the, uh, on the uh, right of the chest. And uh, this baffle is very narrow as you see the contrast go through, it barely crosses. And so it'd be difficult to get a transvenous uh, pacing lead through there. That's why she's got a bunch of uh, epicardial pacing leads on. And sometimes the surgeons make it difficult, such as in this surgery, uh, extra cardiac conduit for a Fontan, where the surgeon takes a Gore-Tex conduit and runs it from the SVC to the IVC, basically uh, going around the heart. So if you put a catheter in through the SVC, you're not going to get into the heart. You're just going to be in this Gore-Tex conduit. Now, pacing leads uh, in children are the weakest link. They tend to break, uh, children tend to grow, and pacing leads aren't designed for growing children. We know that ICD leads uh, have, uh, have not as good survival as pacing leads, and they're even worse in young patients. And epicardial systems are even worse. This is an old epicardial patch, which nobody uses anymore because they all tend to break. And you don't need to be an electrical engineer to see this picture and, and know that that's not gonna conduct electricity. So we thought, let's make thinner leads for thinner patients. We thought that would be a good idea because that would make, take up less room in the veins. But when you try new ideas, sometimes it just doesn't work. Here's a thinner ICD lead, uh, two different brands from two different manufacturers, and they both had problems. One had electrical noise, uh, because these, uh, these cables were so close to each other that there was electrical communication between them and they got noise and the noise was thought by the pacemaker or defibrillator to be uh, arrhythmia and the patients got shocked for it, which they don't like. Uh, and this one, you could see them extrude through the insulation because there wasn't enough insulation around uh, the cables and because they're trying to make the leads thinner. So thinner isn't always better. And we also have to uh, manage these leads because when you put a defibrillator in uh, an 80 year old, it may be the only defibrillator he or she gets, but when you put a defibrillator in a 10 year old, they're going to have decades of lead management. You have to figure out what are we going to do with the old leads? Do you just abandon them in place? Uh, you, do you use the, the big jerk method, which you can interpret however, however you like? Uh, but up in the 20 years ago, this is what we did we admit the patient maybe 30 years ago, uh, and put traction on the lead until it pulled out of the heart. It's pretty brutal. There are uh, sheaths, powered sheaths now. This is a laser sheath that can cut through uh, scar tissue. This is a radio frequency to cut through. And this is, I call this an apple coring mechanical tool with a little uh, sharp edge to uh, cut through or core through any kind of scar. So there's, there are tools and technology but sometimes when you're doing lead extraction in children, you're pulling and pulling and pulling, and you may take out a little piece of heart. If this was a movie, maybe this piece would be, would be beating. Uh, so lead extraction is a little bit scary in children, and we, we want to find better ways. I'm not going to go through lots of this data. 
but this is a study that, that we did looking at lead extraction in children. And there were some that had complex extraction. In fact, most of them, 76% uh, of them were complex extraction of the 200 leads. And we got most of them out, 85% of them came out. Um, and the longer the leads were in, the more likely they were to require complex extraction, meaning using a laser or a powered sheath to get them out and not just pull until they come loose. The longer the lead is in, the harder they are to come out. And so think about that in children, the leads are gonna be in longer than in adult patients. And again, you're gonna fail if the leads are in more than a few years. This is one of the biggest studies I've done uh, over my career in terms of clinical studies. This is uh, a large multi-center uh, international study uh, looking at ICD lead performance. It was a randomized prospective multi-center study comparing different types of leads, basically thin leads versus uh, EPTFE, which is Gore-Tex uh, coated leads to see which ones will last longer and which ones are easier to take out over a six year period. And what we saw was pretty evident that over time, the thin leads were less durable than either standard leads or those that were covered in Gore-Tex uh, that, that had a normal thickness. So thin leads didn't survive as long as, as the standard size leads. And the uh, leads only lasted about two years in those uh, and they caused shocks in 59 patients. 21% of the thin leads failed versus three and a half percent of the Gore-Tex coated leads. So a pretty dramatic difference. And importantly, younger patients were disproportionately impacted because we as clinical electrophysiologists around the country and around the world thought thin leads are probably better for thinner, smaller patients. So we put more thin leads in the younger and smaller kids. And so they were more impacted by uh, this problematic lead set. And so I, I brought those studies up to make the point that let's try to uh, move technology to the point where we don't even need leads. And so in the adult electrophysiology world, there's two leadless pacemakers. Uh, they look about the same uh, and they're implanted about the same way. They both came out in the, the big publications came out in 2015 and 2016. They're delivered through a catheter from the femoral vein and then delivered and undocked in the heart so that what it looks like is just this little leadless pacemaker that sits at the apex of the right ventricle. That's one study. And here's another one from a year later from the other company, <clears throat> similar type of technology, catheter delivered. Now the problem for children is this catheter is somewhere between 24 and 30 French. So that's a, that's a huge garden hose that goes in the leg. And so it's difficult to put that, certainly can't put that in an infant. Um, and we're not sure whether you can put it in the smallest of children. And additionally, this little catheter, sorry, this little pacemaker sits there in the right ventricle, and we're not sure how easy it is gonna be to remove. Uh, and so putting it in a small ch child has concerns for what to do with them later. Here's all the pediatric and adult congenital data on uh, leadless pacemakers. It's not a problem with Zoom, it's that there's nothing there. Uh, here's the first one that was done at our center. My colleague, uh, Dr. Libby Sherwin, put this leadless pacemaker in a young child here. You can see the pacemaker sitting in the right ventricle. Looks nice. There's a case report uh, from, uh, from Israel uh, I like this report. It shows uh, a couple things. It shows a documented prolonged sinus pause. Here you see this child with a long pause. This is continuous from here down to here with asystole. And so good indication for a pacemaker. And they put in the leadless pacemaker. So this child also has an in insertable loop monitor. This is right under the skin, and this is in the right ventricle. So the x-ray gives you a nice comparison of the size of those two. They're both kind of tiny. What about x-ray? I said I was going to talk about x-ray. So what about putting a pacemaker in during, uh, uh, without x-ray? We use this example because this is a pregnant young woman who needed a pacemaker. Con congenital heart disease, documented pause with syncope, 
We couldn't wait till she delivered to, uh, to put the pacemaker in. And so we um, innovated and used that electroanatomic mapping system that I showed you about 20 minutes ago. And here you see the pacemaker as it's going through the heart. This is in the right atrium. Now it's gonna cross the tricuspid valve. I'd marked the tricuspid valve with those purple dots. And now it's in the right ventricle and trying to eventually get it down into the, the bottom of the right ventricle. We're moving up, it's going up to the health flow tract, pull it back a little bit and then seat it in the, uh, in the right ventricular apex. And you can see the pacemaker uh, lead moving nicely through the heart without the use of x-ray. And that's the, uh, the combination of using the electroanatomic mapping system. And this is where it ended. After delivery, we took an x-ray and saw that the lead tip was in great position. I didn't know there was that little loop of lead there. I didn't intend to do that and couldn't see that using the electroanatomic system because we couldn't see the, the shaft of the lead, but that's fine and, uh, and working well. And this is now from several years ago and this patient's doing, doing well with her pacemaker and no more pauses. I'm gonna shift from pacemakers to defibrillators. I know I'm going fast, but I wanna cover a lot in uh, maybe 15, 10, 15 more minutes. This is studies from 20 years ago. And this is, this is the topic that I talked about yesterday during the research symposium as well. So a little bit of overlap for those of you who attended yesterday. So 20 years ago, three different groups reported using a subcutaneous array or subcutaneous lead just under the skin. These are just under the skin, this or this. Uh, to put in a, a defibrillator so that you don't have defibrillation leads transvenously. Now it's been reported for hundreds of children successfully over the past 20 years. And there's multi-center reports with both intermediate and long-term results. The first three studies all published within a month of each other 20 years ago, including ours and two from Europe. Any other ways to put leads on are uh, through videoscopic ports. So in these two videos, you see a uh, pacing lead being screwed onto the heart here by the surgeon. Uh, you've got good visibility. It, it's a smaller uh, port rather than a big sternotomy or thoracotomy, so less morbidity, faster recovery. And on this side, you see a defibrillator lead with a coil going behind in the posterior pericardium. So, uh, and then on x-ray, this is what this looks like here is the coil that goes behind the heart. These are the pacing and sensing leads that still have to be sewn onto the heart. And in this young child, infant, he also has a subcutaneous coil. Uh, since the defibrillator coil is right behind the part of the heart, usually has a very good defibrillation threshold because it's close. Either one of these has a good defibrillation threshold um, and avoids the issues with patches, which I said failed. So now instead of two roots, there are at least four roots, the transvenous root, the epicardial root, which as I mentioned is essentially abandoned, the subcutaneous root, and the pericardial root. But all of these novel implant methods may not be as durable as standard ICDs. This study done by Andy Radbill uh, when he was in Boston and now at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, and this shows the transvenous standard leads in green, the non-transvenous novel implant methods in yellow. What you see is the system survival is lower. Uh, and after about three years, about half of those children needed to have some sort of revision, either changing the generator or changing the leads uh, with a hazard ratio of nearly three, nearly three times as many needed that done with a similar rate of, of shocks. And important to mention though, that those with the non-transvenous systems at the time would not have been eligible for a transvenous ICD system, either because they were too small or their congenital heart disease uh, precluded a uh, transvenous system. So they either had to get the non-standard ICD or nothing. Now, 10 years after those first case reports, the company came out with something called a subcutaneous ICD uh, that looks similar, just a little bit of a mirror image. Here they put the generator on the left side of the chest wall and uh, the coil uh, by the chest. So there's no wires, doesn't require any uh, electrodes in or on the heart. It's all subcutaneous. Um, and the system is placed using anatomic landmarks without the need for fluoroscopy. It's published in the New England Journal in 2010. And one of the 
biggest differences though, is it requires more energy to shock the heart as the hearts between the, the coil and the can requires about three times as much energy uh, than a standard transvenous ICD. And so the device needs to be bigger. Bigger devices in children don't match. Here's the first uh, uh, report in a 10 year old. You can see uh, cosmetically not so great. It's a big device in a small child. Here he is uh, playing a video game with his brother, complaining of dizziness, loss of hearing, and then chest pain. And after 26 seconds of ventricular fibrillation, he gets a life-saving shock, converts him back into sinus rhythm. Thanks to Dr. McLeod from Scotland for sending me this story. There's other uh, publications now. Here's a SICD in a young adult Fontan patient uh, in the SICD here. Uh, they have come out with a new version. It's a little bit smaller, a little bit less thick, and a little bit lighter. Uh, so it's still, you can see, it's still a pretty thick device, uh, but it's new and improved and better than the first version. But it's still pretty big. Here's one, the, probably one of the more recent ones that I've put in. And although it's called a subcutaneous ICD in children, I typically put them submuscular uh, because it's such a big device. I think cosmetically and for padding reasons, it makes it uh, better cosmetically, and it also um, yeah, it also may be better for the patient, but it, it requires a deeper uh, and more invasive incision initially. There have been a few reports in young patients, young meaning up to age 48 or 50. Average age in this study was 20 years. Uh, in 16 patients, three of them required reoperation within nine months, <clears throat> and four of the 16 received a total of 10 inappropriate shocks, mostly for T-wave oversensing, and eight got appropriate shocks, including three for ventricular fibrillation. So there's concern about delayed detection of, of this. And other customizations to put these subcutaneous ICDs in children. Here's a small child uh, from a, a study in France where they had to bend or bow the coil to fit in the small chest. And here's a patient with dextrocardia with a right-sided ICD. It's not just um, uh, flipped by the radiologist, it's the correct dextrocardia. So they put the ICD on the right. There's a bit of concern about a higher risk of infection uh, from several different studies looking at uh, younger patients, maybe because they're smaller and thinner, or maybe because they touch their incisions more, it's hard to know, but the younger patients seem to have a higher risk for, for infection. And they also showed both this undersensing, this top panel of ventricular fibrillation, uh, which isn't sensed, these little S marks are sensing, so it's not sensing the VF, and here oversensing or double counting where it's counting both the QRS and the T wave as a beat. And so it's double counting and shocking during sinus rhythm, which again, patients hate. In this study from the US, uh, again, inappropriate shock. Here's a patient with SVT where they get shocked and double counting. So there's still concerns. And so sometimes you have to be creative in pediatric electrophysiology. And we have to customize these devices to make them work for our patients. So I'm going to spend the last five minutes talking about some of the work we've been doing trying to make a minimally invasive percutaneous pericardial device. And here is a comparison study in animals looking at what the surgeon needs to do now. They need to open the chest just to simply sew the lead to the epicardium. And so we're trying to develop a percutaneous device to just go through and put the lead on that way. This is a port we've developed uh, that has two channels to look in and uh, see where we're going. One hole to put a camera down and the other hole to put uh, a lead down. And this is what it looks like through that camera. Here, the needle is going through the sub port, goes into the pericardial space, and you can see uh, all the critical structures. So you can avoid coronary arteries and other things that you don't want to hit. The wire goes through the needle, the sharp needle is taken out, and then a plastic sheath is inserted uh, over the wire, just like we do in the cath lab. The sheath goes in, and then a defibrillator lead or a pacing lead can go in and fixate it to the epicardium and take the sheath out. And we see just a very small defect in the, in the pericardial tissue after removing the pericardial sheath, and that's the end of the procedure. And then the end of that lead can get 
attached to either standard pacemaker or defibrillator. Here we, we're showing defibrillation. Uh, we put the piglet into ventricular fibrillation and shock him at, at uh, progressively increasing voltages uh, to see what the defibrillation threshold is. Here's 10 joules shock, still in VF, 20 joules shock, and converts to sinus rhythm. So the threshold is somewhere between 10 and 20. This is what the lead looks like. There's a little tine, almost looks like a little fishing hook that holds it in place. And after three months, uh, we can look and see some fibrosis to hold the shocking coil or the pacing lead in place for uh, long-term fixation. And then finally, this is our, our current prototype of a minimally invasive uh, percutaneous uh, pacemaker. This is that uh, one of those leadless pacemakers that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago that the adult EP docs and rarely some in pediatrics are putting transvenously through a 30 French sheath. So we've taken that, put a little cap and leadlet on it. Uh, so this is an all-in-one pacemaker with a little short leadlet with an electrically active tip. Oops, sorry, uh, with an electrically active tip. And this is what it looks like when it goes in through the percutaneous pericardial uh, port uh, and is uh, attached to the apocardial surface of the heart. Pacing uh, electrode is here. Uh, and then the generator is nice and small. I can just go under the skin in that sub xiphoid incision. And so that's what we're working on. Uh, we have it prototyped. We've uh, uh, looked at piglets in both acute and chronic studies and are ready to put this in a baby. In fact, we had a baby uh, in our institution that was born at 1.4 kilograms with complete heart block and were ready and got FDA compassionate use approval to put the device in that child, got our IRB to agree. Uh, when I talked to the dad, he just didn't want to have his baby be the first in human. And so they, they declined, but we have ready if we have or when we have the next uh, premature infant that's going to need a miniaturized pacemaker uh, around the country. Hopefully we can uh, use this device and we're continuing to refine some of the fixation and other properties to make sure that this is safe and ready to use in children when needed. So in summary, I showed you a few different things that uh, innovate innovations for pediatric electrophysiology. that are often modifications of commercially available products or adult uh, sized tools that can be miniaturized for children. This is how we watch TV 50 years ago. It's not that long ago and we had these big black and white consoles that were so heavy you couldn't lift them. And now this is how you watch TV on your phone. Some of you might be doing it now instead of watching Zoom. So it's very reasonable to think that this is an ICD, a defibrillator from 1988, not that long ago. So we could imagine that soon enough, we should be able to deliver uh, pacing and ICD therapy percutaneously without having to open the chest for children and infants. I'd like to thank some of my team uh, that have worked on this. Uh, I do like working with uh, young uh, fellows and uh, biomedical engineers who are uh, driving this and the enthusiasm behind it. I mentioned yesterday in the research symposium that all I have to do is draw something on a napkin and they will compete to prototype it or 3D print it or try to make a viable model. Uh, so it's great to have a, a team of, of engineers, the cardiology fellows who have come through my lab and have gone on to become uh, cardiology attendings around the country. Uh, I'm proud of them and uh, hope to see great things coming from many of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was fascinating how you took us through all the advances, major advances. I'm sure there are also others in pediatric EP and especially your, your work on trying to minimize uh, invasiveness and reduce radiation. That's terrific. I also enjoy seeing uh, some novel, more applications for our potential uh, interventional MRI suites that we are, uh, we are working on. And uh, 
and more applications for cardiac MRI, the fact that you could see your the burn, that's, that's really amazing. It would be so wonderful to be able to bring it live so that you can actually see what you do and do more if you need to. And, uh, uh, you know, in interventional cardiology, we um, obviously have those limitations too. Most of the device technology, devices and wires and everything we use, all the catheter technology is not, not MRI compatible. Uh, so do you see that, uh, how's the, the future for ablation catheters, MRI compatible ablation catheters? <laughs> yeah, you, you hit it right on the head, uh, Jackie. Thank you again. Uh, it, it, it is the rate limiting step is the tools that are available uh, for MRI compatible catheters are, are, are few and far between. I know people are working on it. Uh, and uh, to, to develop tools for, for interventional cardiology, you know, things like a, a MRI compatible biopsome to do biopsies would be, would be the, the next example of something that should be relatively easy to do without fluoroscopy. Uh, but in, a, in ablation technology, it's even more challenging because of the electrical signals and the incompatibility of uh, electricity and MRI together. And so creating MRI compatible EP tools is, is an additional challenge, but is being done in several places around the world. Yeah. And the, the, uh, we have now uh, some MRI compatible pacemakers, right? That uh, unfortunately a lot of our adult congenital patients don't have, and when you need them to have an MRI, you realize that you, you're stuck with only CT as an option, right? That's well, yeah. So I think, you know, they're, they're uh, we and others have been, um, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but have been doing, I guess it's published, so it's okay, that uh, people do MRIs on patients with non-MRI conditional devices. And you just have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. The theoretical risks of um, damage to the device is one thing. Uh, in a, um, changing the programming inadvertently um, but the most concern is heating of the tip of the pacing lead, which seems to be higher with abandoned leads. So patients who have epicardial leads that aren't connected to a generator are probably the highest risk. Um, but if they have a generator attached, that seems to draw the heat into it. And so it's not actually all going to the tip. So under um, careful monitoring conditions and with an EP nurse in the room to monitor the rhythm and the pacemaker, we, we have done them even if they're not MRI conditional devices. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I you know, we always have uh, those same questions with all coils and, you know, yeah. and, uh, and it's, uh, it's great that uh, you're pushing the envelope there and allowing for some patients and testing whether that's possible because um, often a lot of the radiology departments will say, oh no, impossible, we can't do that. And, yeah, we get some pushback as well. And again, it's a sort of a risk benefit analysis. And, you know, if, if, it, if it is concerning, as you said, uh, CT is a, is a good alternative. Uh, uh, but since my topic today was reducing radiation, CT is not, not as good as MRI for, from that standpoint. Yeah, it's um, truly you know, amazing with, with the EP ablation, how you guys have been able to completely get rid of radiation. Um, uh, do you, do you think what's, what's happening, what do you think will be in, in the next 10 years? Was the... Wow, that's a good question. You know, it's interesting, when I, was, when I was an EP fellow for the year that I did EP, I, I, I got so much radiation exposure because as the fellow, you're the one standing right by the, uh, the camera, right by the, the fluoro tube. And so every month, my uh, Alara badge would be above the limit every single month for that whole year. And... You know, and you know, I was I was worried about it, but uh, and then for years as an attending, you know, uh, you you get uh, just like you in interventional cardiology, you get a lot of radi radiation as an interventional cardiologist or interventional EP. So this has been remarkable how much that's changed. And for about half the cases now, I don't I don't even put my lead on. If I think this is going to be a right sided pathway, uh, I I don't put my lead on at all. And uh, if it turns out to be left sided. I, I may break scrub and, and add lead uh, in case we need to step on the floor for uh, you know seconds for uh, transeptal. So it, it's it's just incredible how much it's transformed uh, what we do, uh, and uh, and so so that's been that's been exciting. 
Uh, 10 years from now, I think, yeah, I think uh, MRI, you know, doing, doing procedures in the MRI lab, I, I don't think we'll be doing fluoroscopy on anybody uh, in 10 years, uh, I hope. Uh, you know, I know my dad used to get a fluoroscopy of his feet before he got his shoes fit. And that was standard at the shoe store. They would fluoro your feet back in the 50s and 60s. I, I don't know exactly when, but around then. And, you know, they didn't think anything of it. Uh, and now I think we're going to look back in, in 2030 or 2040. We're going to look back and say, wow, you guys use X-ray to, to image the body. That's that's kind of crazy. Yeah, so yeah, and I, you know, we had the pleasure of visiting your institution. I think it may have been, it was all before COVID. Yeah, so I you remember. guys have an amazing, you've been pioneers in, you know, interventional MRI, and that's, uh, you know, how, how to use it, utilize MRI, um, just pushing the envelope. And, uh, and now, you know, a lot of our institutions, including ours, are trying to set that up. So it's uh, congratulations to you. Well, I'm sure Dr. Christopher is going to do a great job with that. And uh, we look forward to collaborating on some exciting uh, projects. Yes, yeah, so I think um, we're, we're going to go into the meet and greet next. So uh, anybody can join us there. It's a different uh, Zoom link. Um, so we'll, we're going to move there. And uh, you can feel free to then uh, chat with Charlie. And um, hopefully um, we'll connect soon. All right. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Dr. Carlson, there's a uh, question in the Q&A if you could address Oh, it. yes. I didn't see. Um, I'm looking at the, oh, I was looking at the chat. Sorry. Uh, okay. So Anthony Pompa, he's one of our fellows. Uh, and as you said, so continuous ICD solve the intracardiac lead program, but have their own issues. What factors do you uh, use at your institution besides size or need for pacing to determine if you'll offer a patient uh, a subcutaneous ICD or a transvenous one? Thank you, Anthony. Um, so yeah, other than the size, the, the big limitation of the subcutaneous ICD as it stands now is uh, they, they, aren't, they don't pace. And so you can't use it for someone who's gonna require chronic pacing. Uh, you can't use it for someone who you would like to use anti-tachycardia pacing to avoid a shock. So someone with an atrial tachycardia or a VT that can be paced out of. And you can't use it for someone who needs cardiac resynchronization therapy, pacing to resynchronize the heart. So I think those are the three uh, most common uh, limitations of, of the SICD besides its size. So um, if, uh, if the patient's big enough, and doesn't need either anti-bradycardia pacing or anti-tachycardia pacing or resynchronization pacing, they could get an SICD. And hopefully we'll develop a smaller one for children. That's great. All right, well, wonderful. Thank you. We're going to wrap up because it's getting to nine o'clock and we'll reconnect then in the, with the meet and greet Zoom.